Good morning, Faith family. Everyone's doing well this morning. Appreciate it. Everyone coming this way. Once in a while, we appreciate the precious Holy Spirit coming to visit with us this morning for our song service. We just thank God for what He's going to do with the further services this day. You have your Bible, I'd like to read along. Let's go to the book of Habakkuk. Well, it's in there. <laughs> y'all look at me, y'all look at me. Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 3. Uh, if you'll go to the New Testament, go left. One of the ways you'll find this nestled in there between Nahum and Zephaniah, I promise you it's there. Uh, it's not three chapters, so be, be mindful of that. You'll go right past it if you're not careful. I'll give you a little extra time this morning to find your plate. Habakkuk chapter 3. Go ahead and mark your place when you get there. We'll be all over Habakkuk, but I want to read uh, the latter part of chapter 3 to begin with. This is not one of those passages that I would normally be a go-to passage for me, but this is where God led us. And I... I wrestled with it for a little bit this week. I said, there's got to be something else, God. And he said, no, this is where we're going. So here we are. All right. Everybody there? Amen. 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 Still here for the face. All right. I'm only going to read a couple of verses. So I'll make sure you watch that. Uh, we're going to look at verse 17 <clears throat> through 19 in, in uh, chapter 3 of, of the book of Habakkuk. Verse 17 it says, And although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vine, the labor of the olive shall fail, the field shall yield no meat, the flock shall be cut off from the pole, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like his hind feet, and that he will make me to walk upon my high places to the chief singer on my string instruments. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you that we might be able to look to you, the author and the finisher of our faith, for those things that we stand in need of. And we thank you for this word that you give us this morning. I pray, God, that you would go ahead of us and prepare this. I pray, God, that you would just begin to, to work and move in this, that we might be able to see lives change and burdens lifted off the lives of your people. I pray if there's one, two, or ten that don't know you in the free part of forgiveness of sin, that you would touch that heart this morning. Let them see that need for salvation. Draw nigh to you before it's everlasting too late. And I pray you would touch me that I might be able to effectively communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray, God, that you need to get me out of myself and fill me with your spirit that I might be able to rightly divide the word of truth that it may go forth and it may be able to, to accomplish the task that you set forth in this service today. We give you liberty to do your perfect work. And we're going to be careful to give you all the praise, all the honor and the glory for you're truly worthy to be praised in this place today. And we're going to give you that. We love you so much. We thank you. We ask all these favors and blessings in Jesus' precious and holy name we do pray. And all God's people say it. Amen. 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 We look at Habakkuk. If I'm not, you know, I, I've heard that pronounced different ways. If I'm not saying that right, I'm sure somebody will let me know. So as we begin to look at that, we're going to look at the, at the life of Habakkuk. There, it was a time that, <clears throat> that we begin to look at him as a prophet. And he was a little bit different than other prophets. He was a little bit different than, than many of the prophets. But he lived during the final decades of, uh, of Israel's southern kingdom of Judah. And it was a time of injustice. It was a time of adultery. It was a time of, <clears throat> of the leadership was, was going different directions. I, I believe as you begin to look, you begin to see a lot of relevancy in this passage. The scripture, and we can just kind of usher it right in today's world. But as we begin to, to look at this, um, unlike many of the prophets, he didn't really prophesy to the people. He began to he began to address the, 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 the very person of God. And he began to have a conversation as you read through this through in, in chapter one, all the way through verse or chapter three, you'll begin to see him having a conversation between him and God. And he raises a complaint and he draws God's attention to that complaint. And he brought, draws his attention to the suffering, to the injustice, to the troubles, to the trials of the nation. And he begins to demand that God would do something about this. And I would believe as we begin to look what happens when we see this, we make our, our, our petition known to God sometimes. And, and I think as we begin to look at this, that's when we come to expect God to come in and begin to meet that need. And we get an expect, expectation. We pray with an expectation. 
expectation of what God's going to do. And we want God to fix this and make it better. And I believe as we look at this, we see that here there was the same complaint. That this was his expectation, expectation of God. He wanted God to make this better. He wanted God to change the situation for this country. And I want to go back and we'll read in, in, in chapter 1, you know, just a couple verses right there. Let's look at his mindset. Let's look at how he's feeling. It says in verse 1 of chapter 1, it said the burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. This is his vision. This is what he's seeing. He's not, it's not a future vision. It's a vision he's looking at in the present time with his own eyes. And he cries out to God. And he said, Oh Lord, in verse 2, how long shall I cry? And thou wilt not hear. Even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save me. Why dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance? The spoiling and the violence are before me, and they are they that raise up strife and contention. Therefore, the law is slack, the judgment doth never go forth, for the wicked doth compass about the righteousness. Therefore, wrong, proceed, wrong judgment proceedeth. And as we look at this, he's just crying out to God. He said, God, where are you? Why are you not hearing me? How long am I going to cry out and you not hear what I'm saying? And we go on to verse 5 and it, it's God's response. God responds back to him in verses 5 to 11. And he said, Behold among the heathen in regard the wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days which you will not believe, though it be told you. For lo, I will raise up the child he is, the bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to, to possess the dwelling places that are not there. They are terrible, they're dreadful, they're judgment, they're digging, he shall perceive them of themselves. Their horses are also swifter than lepers, and they are more fierce than the evening wolves, and their horsemen shall spread themselves, and their horsemen shall come from afar. They shall fly as an eagle, and a hasten to eat. They shall come all for violence. The face shall suck up as the east wind, and they shall gather captivity as the sand. And they shall scoff at kings and princes, and shall scorn unto them. And they shall deride every stronghold, and shall heap dust, and take it. And this shall change his mind, and they shall pass them a thin, imputing his power unto his hand. And as we begin to look at this, God begins to answer him. Now notice what happened here. All of a sudden we see a man that's cried out to God. God, why are you not hearing me? God, why are you not moving at, 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 the, at the request that I'm making for you? And I think as we begin to look at that, sometimes we probably all been in this place. We probably, there's probably been a day, an hour, there's probably been a time in our life when we say, God, why are you not hearing me? It don't seem like you're hearing me, God. Nothing's changed in my situation. Nothing's changed in my life. And sometimes we begin to look at this and we, we begin to think, God, why do you not hear us? Why are you not moving in our situation? But as we begin to look at this, we see that just as well as that uh, back and tall, we see that God heard his prayer. God heard his, his, his complaint. He heard his, his trouble. He heard his strife. He knew what was going on. He made it very clear he knew what was going on. He said, listen, uh, uh, I've, got, I've heard your prayer. He said, and you're not catching me off guard. I know the condition of the land. I know the condition of the people. And he said, this is what I'm going to do. <clears throat> he said, I'm going to raise up the child in to come again to the southern kingdom of Judah. Now, if we begin to think about this, we begin to think about exactly what God's saying here. He's telling Habakkuk, he's saying, listen, he said, I've heard what you're saying, and I've got a solution. I, I, I've heard, I, I'm fixing to answer your prayer. Not necessarily the way you want it answered, not the way you're expecting it, not the way you're thinking or anticipating, but I'm about to answer your prayer. And as we begin to look at this in verse 12 through 21, I'll probably not going to read that, but it looks like all of a sudden he says, what God? You're going to raise up the Chaldeans. You're going to raise them up. This is not what I'm asking for. This is not what I'm expecting. And he's asking God, why, God? Why are you doing this? And I think as we begin to look at that, he's thinking, he said, you know, here they are. They're worse than Israel. They're worse than Judah. They're worse than the people that are here. And God said, I know that. I'm not, a, I'm not condoning what they do. I'm not condoning, but they are a tool and an instrument in my hand that I will use to get Israel where Israel needs to be. And as we begin to understand this, we begin to think that uh, Habakkuk is looking at God and he, he, he said, they're more they're more violent than, than Israel. So why, how can you do this? And he's like, he demands a response from God. 
And you know, the good thing about it, God, it don't matter what you throw at him. He, he's big enough to defend himself. He's big enough to give you back an answer. It might not be the answer you want. might not be the answer we desire. But he, he's big enough to respond in a way that he knows what he's doing, that he has complete confidence, and he, he is in control. And I think as we begin to look at this, this is the response in verses uh, chapter 2, verses 2 through 5. And I'm going to read that, that God gave back to Habakkuk. Now notice this. In verse 2 of chapter 2, it said, And the Lord answered me. And he said, Write the vision and make it plain upon the table. That he may read it, run, that he may run that read it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but the end, for at the end I, it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. I will not tarry. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright with him. But the just shall live by faith. And yet also, because he transgresseth the wine, he is a proud man, neither keepeth keep at home, or enlargeth his, enlargeth his desire mill, as death cannot be satisfied, but gathered unto all nations, and heapeth unto all people. Now as we begin to look at this, he tells Zechariah, he said, this is what I want you to do. He said, I'm about to show you something. He said, I want you to write it down. He said, I want you to, to write it so the people can understand what's coming. He said, I don't want to be a secret. I'm not hiding anything from anybody. I want them to know what's going on. And he goes on and he says, listen. He said, I want you to know that the just shall live by faith. Now, as we begin to kind of dissect this and pick, take, unpack this passage of Scripture, it, it's interesting how God begins to respond to him. This is not what Habakkuk wants to hear. As he begins to hear the word of God, he begins to think, man, this is not what I anticipated. Here I've been crying out. I've been, I, I, I've been on my faith. I've been seeking God. And here, this is not what I want to hear. And I think as we begin to look at this, we want God to meet us at this point. And I believe Habakkuk was just the same way. He wanted God to meet him at this point and just kind of come down and put his arm around him and say, Habakkuk, I, I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry that you're going through this. I'm really sorry that you're having to see what you see. I'm really sorry that things are not going the way that you expected. And let me just make all this better. Let me just fix all this for you. That's the expectation that he's wanting. That's what he desires. And I think as we begin to look at that, when we come to, to God's throne of grace so many times, that's what we want. We want God to fix our situation. God to come and fix our situation. And is that wrong? No, that's not necessarily wrong. It's okay to ask. But we just got to understand and put ourselves in perspective and know that God's ways are not our ways and God's ways are higher than our ways. And sometimes we just have to ask the hard question and say, God, what are you trying to do here? And I think as we begin to look at this, Habakkuk 1, I'm going to call him Zechariah before we get through it. I don't know why that keeps coming to my mind. But Habakkuk keeps coming to this point, and he's just wanting God to fix the situation. He saw God move in the past. He knows what God is able to do. And sometimes there's times in God's Word that He would move instantaneously, and things would change in a moment, and just that quick. But this is not one of those times. So I think as you begin to look at this, he's looking for God to fix this situation. So many times I, I see us wanting God to fix our situation. All we can see is the problem that needs God's attention. And if we don't see ever see us or what God may be trying to do in our life as a problem. And I think as we begin to really dig into this and understand this story, I think things are not always as they seem. It's always got to be someone else's fault. It's always got to be someone else has got to be the common denominator in the problem is up. And here's the thing. If you've ever noticed our prayers, if we're not careful, we'll tell God how to fix it. God, this is who the problem is. God, if you can get them fixed, everything will be all right. If you look at this, Habakkuk was leaning towards God. If you can just get all the people that are committing idolatry, if you can get them straightened out, but first you need to go back and look at those religious leaders. They have, they have, they have fell down on their job. They're not doing what they need to do, so it's got to be somebody else's fault. And as we begin to look at this, Habakkuk looking at this, and he's the prophet to the nation, and God says, I want you to write down the vision. Well, what vision has he got at this point? Where all he is is angry. He's angry and upset because things are not going the way that he expected them to go. And God's also going to write this down. Now, when we begin to look at this, we're going to see 
see that God changes his perspective. Because as we read that, that passage of scripture in the end, that's the end of the story. But it don't start out that way. And I think as we begin to look at that so many times, we see things totally different than what they really are. And if we can just get a hold of the perspective from God, we're going to see how God does this in just a moment. And, and I may have used this as an illustration before. I'm not real sure if I have or not. If you've heard this, then it's okay. <coughs> but we'll, we'll tell you again. But it, it's something that happened to me that, that I looked at, and I thought it was one way, but it was totally the other way. I thought it was somebody else, but it was really me. And as you begin to kind of look at this story, I also think about Habakkuk in his life, and I also think about what we do from time to time when we look beyond or look right around our circumstances and don't look beyond our circumstances, and then we look at all of this. It's just got to be all about somebody else. It's been years ago. <coughs> we was up. <coughs> I was at the Georgia Public Safety Training Center in Forsyth. And <coughs> we was up there one day, and it come break time about 10 o'clock in the morning, and I, I went out there and I got me a pack of crackers out of the vending machine and I had tables out there. Now this is before the day made your cell phone. We didn't have cell phones, so we picked up a newspaper. I mean that's a, probably a thing that's passed for a lot of people now. Maybe some of y'all still read the newspaper. But as we in that day and age, that's, that's all we had. We had TV and we had the newspaper. And <clears throat> we take it, I'd seen this newspaper and I was sitting there, and I got me drinking a pack of crackers, and I was looking at the at the sports page of the newspaper, and, and here I am, everything's going good. A guy comes up, he sits down across from me, we make small talk, good morning, how are you? I noticed you see me on his shirt, he worked with George Bureau of Investigation. Well, I didn't know him. I, I don't even know if we introduced ourselves. I don't think we did. I think it was just good morning, how are you? He sat down across from me. I'm reading my paper and all of a sudden I hear the familiar sound of cellophane crackling across the table. And as I raised up my newspaper, I looked and this guy had picked up my crackers from off the table and was eating them. <laughs> and I sit there for a moment and I said, well, okay, that's fine. Have yourself a cracker. <laughs> he ate a cracker, he laid them down on the, on the table there. I pulled it back to my side of the table. I eat a cracker. I lay them back on my side of the table. All of a sudden, I look and his hand comes under my newspaper and drags those crackers back out from under my side of the table over to his side of the table, gives him a cracker out, and begins to eat another one of my crackers. Well, that's okay. You need two of my crackers. Probably the Christian thing to do was just give you the pack of crackers again. But I was not going to be out of I pulled those crackers back to my side. I ate me another cracker. And I pulled them up good and tight to the edge of the table. I said, I'm going to see if he can get them out. <laughs> I finished off those crackers. He went on his way. I went on my way. I didn't think anything about it until I went back in class. I sit down. The, the, they started lecturing again. And I started to take notes. And I reached in my pocket to get my pen. And lo and behold, there's my pack of crackers. <laughs> Joy when you fall into various trials. 
Yeah. That's totally against our nature. Count it all joy when you fall in various trials. Notice what he didn't say. He didn't say count it all joy if you fall into various trials. He said when you fall into various trials. So that tells me one thing. Trials are going to come. Yeah. Trials are going to come for Christians. Trials are going to come for, for, for everybody no matter what. But just because we're a Christian don't make us exempt from having troubles and trials. And I think he was trying to help us help, uh, back to understand this. And I think there's a great uh, example of this in Genesis chapter 32. Uh, there's a man by the name of Jacob. We, we've talked about him before. But Jacob was, <clears throat> he was a schemer. And Jacob did a lot of things and he schemed his brother out of blessing his father as another sermon for another day. But as you begin to look at this, Jacob left there with a <clears throat> With his brother mad with him, desiring to kill him, he stayed on for 20 years, and he's still doing the same stuff, and all of a sudden, God calls him to come back to his brother, and God says, I'm fixing to reconcile this situation. I'm going to fix this. And here Jacob gets to a, to a place at the, the, the fort of Jabba, there at the crossing of the river. And here he is. He's looking to God. He sees everything on the other side of the river. And it's him and God. He's alone one night with God. And he, he, he just poured his heart out to God. He grabbed on to God. And he said, God, he said, I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me. He said, because you got to understand. I'm going back to a brother, as far as I know, wants to kill me. And God says, I'm going to reconcile this situation. I'm going to fix this. But first of all, Jacob, i got to fix you. Amen. And sometimes I think about that in, in, in our Christian world. Sometimes we have trouble. We have trial. And sometimes we just need to, not that God needs permission. But sometimes I think it will make it a lot easier for us if we'll just say, God, if there's something that I need to do in this situation, God, if there's something you're trying to show me in this situation, God, I give you permission. Because, God, I want you to be able to, 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 to grow me in, in, the, in the places that you want to grow me. I want you to sanctify me where you want to sanctify me. And I think as we look at this story, Jacob wanted that situation fixed. And God said, let me fix you first. I'm going to take care of you first. In chapter 3, as we get into to chapter 3 of, of Habakkuk, he begins to just pray for mercy. And, and through his prayer, his mind was taken back to the... Exodus of Egypt when the children of Israel left out of the bondage of Egypt. Now you know that story and I don't have time to go back and, and get too deep in that story but I want us to think about a couple of things that happened there. As we begin to look at this, we begin to see that God had a plan for the, the Israelites. He was bringing them out of the bondage of Egypt. Now, it would have been real simple for God to have just snapped his fingers and they would have all left. But he was working through Pharaoh that he might bring them out. And we know that there was plague after plague after plague. We know that that's when we do communion. We know that there was a Passover. We know that they took the, the, the blood of the, of the lamb and they placed it upon the, the, the doorpost and down the window, across the window and down the doorpost. And as we begin to understand that, we begin to see a process. We begin to see a series of events that had taken place in order for God to do this. And as we begin to do this, it was back and forth there for a little while. All of a sudden, they begin to wonder they began to wonder, was God really going to do something? They began to wonder when God was going to do something. And I'm sure Moses' prayer may have been to God, why is this happening like this? Amen. When's something going to happen? And I think as we look at this, all of a sudden he led them out to the, to the, to the Red Sea. And we begin to see that Moses took, took, took his rod, struck the water, and the water go hither and hither. And we begin to see them go across on dry land. Now, as we understand this, this is God's way of bringing them out of a bad situation. It took a while. It was probably not like they expected it at all. But God began to move in that situation. Now, as we think about that, we need to understand that when, when he read this, this gave him a little bit of hope. This was kind of the shift. Now, understand it. God told him to write this down. I want you to write down the vision. So his mind goes back to a place and a time when the children of Israel were in the bondage of Egypt. Understand, God just told him that the children of Israel are about to be in the bondage of the Chaldean. Now he's thinking about this. And he's writing these things down. And he's understanding what's going on. And all of a 
of a sudden we see that shift in his prayer in chapter 3. We see a shift in his thinking. He realizes what God has done in the past. He can do it again. And I think so many times if, we, if we'll just think back for a little bit about what God has done in our life and we can stand on the promises and we can stand on the character of God and know beyond the shadow of doubt what He did in the day and age of Moses He can do in the day and age of us. Amen. If we can get that in our spirit, what He did last year in our life, He can do again in our life. If we begin to, to understand who God is and exactly what God can do, we begin to see there's nothing that's impossible with Him. So all of a sudden, He realized what He did in the past He can do again, and He realizes that God has a greater plan for Judah than the current suffering that they're in. So here He is, He's looking at this, and all He can see is the current suffering that Judah is going through. He's looking at them and He says, God, why don't you do something? He said, I look out of this and all I can see, I see trouble, I see strife, I see heartache, I see all that. But let's move that into our lives for just a moment. God has a greater plan for our lives than any current situation we may be in. Understand that and think about that. I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know what you're going through. You may be not, you may not be going through a trial. But I promise you, if you live long enough, you'll go through a trial. Yeah. You'll have a heartache. You'll have strife in your life. But just know when it comes, there's absolutely nothing that God can't leverage for your good and for His glory. Amen. Just know that, there, that He has a greater plan for my life and your life than the current or the future suffering that we may be going through. Yeah. So as we see this and understand this, He wants He wants uh, by back to know that, look, you may be going through a crisis right now, but I got a great plan. I got a bigger picture. He wants to grow our faith. He wants to sanctify us. He, through this process, He's going to make us stronger when we get to the other side. So He's telling Habakkuk, He said, write this down. Keep a, keep a record of it. I want you to write this vision down. If we begin to say, we might not be able to see it right now, but hold on. But wait on God. God wants to put this stuff in perspective. And as we begin to see this little bit of shift in the life of, uh, of Habakkuk, we kind of pick it up in verse, verse 3 there, verse, chapter 3, verse 1. And he begins to pray for mercy. And he, he says this, he said, A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet of uh, Shikonah. O Lord, I have heard thy speech and I was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years, and the midst of the years make known. In wrath, remember mercy. He came from Teman, the Holy One of Mount Paris. His glory covered the heavens and earth was full of His praise. He's thinking back to who God was. He's thinking back to how God was. And he begins to go on in this and he picks up on that story of, of the exodus out of the bondage of Egypt. Now, here's the interesting thing about that. As we get a little further down into this, and I don't have, have time to really get all into it, but I want, us to, I want us to just kind of look at what God's about to do right here. Notice verse 17 and 18, and that's where we read the start bit. Now, that's the passage of Scripture that we read from in the very beginning. Now, as we go back to, to chapter 1, verse 1, we don't see the same mindset. Let me just kind of compare it. This is contrast for just a moment. Let me go back to verse 1, or chapter 1, verse 1. He said, The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. O Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear me? Even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not say, Do you see that it sounds like he's angry with God? Do you see that he, it sounds like he has no confidence in God at all? Verse 3 says, Why dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance for spoiling and violence are before me? And they are that they are that, that rise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slack. The people, the, the law keepers are not doing what they're supposed to do. Judgment doth never go forth, for the wicked doth come past about the righteous, and therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. So you see, as we look at that, he's upset. He's angry. He has no confidence in God. He feels like God has forsaken him. He feels like he's praying and he's praying in vain. And all of a sudden, we begin to see a shift when God told him to write it down. As we begin to think about that, sometimes in our life, we just have to write things down. Sometimes we just have to make a little note. Sometimes we just have to get us a passage of Scripture. We need to stand on that passage of Scripture. We need to highlight that passage of Scripture. We need to underline the circle do whatever we need to do. And we need to get a hold of that. And we need to know beyond a shadow of doubt that it don't matter what we're going through, that does not negate the, the, 
of the presence of God. We begin to understand that no matter what we're struggling with, that does not mean that God don't hear our prayers. That does not mean that God don't care about us. That all that means is God has a greater plan and God's working and moving and we can't see it. You know, as we begin to look at that, so many times when we get bogged down in our problems, we can't see, but just from here to there. But God, He sits on His throne in glory, and He sees the whole picture. He sees greater things than we can ever see. He sees things that we'll, we'll never be able to wrap our feeble little minds around. And all of a sudden, we're looking here, and we're seeing a portion of the picture. We're seeing just a little bit of it. And all of a sudden, we're saying, God, why are you not doing anything? God, why are you not moving in my situation? And God's thinking, I'm working hard as I can. I'm moving in your situation. You just don't know. You're just not seeing anything yet because you can't see very far. And I think as we begin to see this, he begins to write this down. He goes back. He remembers what God has done. He remembers how God has moved in this situation. Now let's go back to verse 17 and 18. And this is what he says. Remember just a few minutes ago, just a couple chapters ago, he was angry, he was upset, he had no confidence in God. And now in verse 17 he says, And all of the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall the fruit of the vines, and the labor of the olive oil shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat, the flock shall be cut off of the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stall. I'm going to stop right there for just a moment. If you look at what he's saying, if everything that he said happened, it would be detrimental for the land of Egypt. If they didn't have any vineyard, if all of their crops failed, if all of their animals died, can you imagine that was their sustenance? That was what they depended on. And he's saying if all of this goes away, if everything that we have falls apart, if it all just crumbles beneath our feet, notice what he says in verse 18. Yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Now we begin to look at that. What's just happened? Listen to him begin to praise God. Listen to what he's saying. He's beginning to say, look here, if it all falls apart, if everything that I got falls out from under my feet, I'm still going to praise him. I'm still going to honor him. And I think so many times that we get to that point, we think all these things that we surround ourselves, it, it don't matter what we've got, if it all falls apart, if it all goes away, and we might not like it, it may be a little uncomfortable for us, but we've got to understand, as long as we have God, we still have hope, we still know he's in control, we still know that there's a plan and there's a purpose for our life. And it don't matter how much of it goes to the wayside. We find out in Job, I don't have time to go there. But as you look at the life of Job, everything that he had fell apart. But all of a sudden, God began to restore it. God gave him back twice as much as he had to begin with. So as we understand this, as long as our faith is in God, as long as we're trusting him, God is the one that can put it all back together and he can do it. But he can do it one-fold, two-fold, ten-fold, or a hundred-fold, however he chooses to do it. And Isaiah, Isaiah, I know you'll call it somebody in a Habakkuk, has come to the point in his life where he realizes. He realized that God would do to depend on him. He realized that God was able to meet the needs that was in his life. Now, I want you to notice this. How did this happen? Exactly, was it all about just reading or thinking back? I, I, I believe that there's a little bit more to that. I believe there's something else that just happened in Habakkuk's life that brought him to this situation. And I think there's a clue in verse 19. But let's read this together. It says, The Lord God is my strength. And he will make my feet like pine's feet. And he will make me to walk upon my high places. And as we begin to look at that now, in order to understand what he's saying here, he says this. He said, my feet, he will, he will make my feet like pine's feet. Now we've got to understand why. Now, he's not talking about back legs. If you read that on the surface, it sounds like he's talking about an animal and some, with some back legs, a strong back leg. Think about this for just a moment. Go back and look at where the, that word hinds, H-I-N-D-N, is a female deer. And as we begin to understand that he 
he's saying, look, he did, and some of you just got a different translation of the Bible. It may even say here in your Bible. But as you begin to look at this and understand what he's saying here, he's saying that it, it, God has made me like this deer. Now understand, they are very familiar with these animals. This animal is very indigenous to that, that society, that culture, that landscape over there. And as we begin to see this, he is very familiar with this animal. You would see these animals. Much like a ram or something to that extent, but you would see on these rocks or them on this rocky outcropping way high up in the mountains. That's where you would find these animals. And he said, God, that's what he said. First of all, he goes on still praising for God a little bit more in verse 19, but he says this. He said, Yeah, the Lord is my strength, and he's gonna make my feet like deer feet. And he will make me to walk upon mine high places. Now think about what he's saying here. He's saying God's going to make me like one of these deer that's going to be able to step up on the side of the mountain. And he's going to cause me to be able to walk out of this valley. He's going to cause me to be able to walk up onto the high places or the low places in my life and give me a better view of what's going on. He's about to change my perspective. Now as we think about this, he said he's giving me a sure footing and he's elevating me to a high place. Now, in order to understand that, we like the high places. He wants them to understand. He said, I'm not buried, but rather elevated. He said, I'm not, I'm not beat down, but I'm lifted up. And he causes them to rise up. And we're drawn to these high places. Why? Because it changes our perspective. It changes how we see things. We begin to see a little bit of the picture, but all of a sudden, as God raises us up and elevates us up just a little bit, it's kind of like deer hunting. It's amazing what you can see the higher you get your deer stand. Amen. You get in the ground line, you see right what's right in front of you. You see what comes to the corn pile. You don't see them coming to the corn pile, all of a sudden you look and there they are. But you get a higher thing, you see them coming way over there. You see deer you may not have ever seen before. You see deer you may not have seen at all if been, unless you had a high deer stand. So as we begin to look at this, we begin to see that God is raising him up and as he begins to elevate him, he elevates his perspective. I can get a picture of him sitting down and all of a sudden he goes back in, in, in chapter 3 and he begins to say this. He said, I'm like a watchman on the wall. Well, where did he come from? Here he was, he come from a place and brought that he was sitting down in the mully grub, sitting down, beat up, just, just devastated about what was going on in his life. He was sitting down, and here he was, all of a sudden God spoke to him, and he probably told him to stand up. Amen. Stand up. And then we find him going from a place of, <clears throat> of sitting to a place on the wall where he was a watchman. He has elevated his position so that he might be able to see what God is doing. Now, let's think about this for just a moment. Let's go back to that imagery of uh, Exodus in chapter 3. Exodus is when God brought the children of Israel, or the children of his people out of, the, out of the bondage and delivered them from the bondage of the Egyptians. We understand that story. We look at that, we see that this is a picture of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. We see that as bringing us out of the bondage of sin, bringing us to a place in our life. Moses risked his life to bring the children of Israel out of the bondage of Egypt, but Jesus gave his life on the cross in Calvary to bring us out of the bondage of sin. And as we understand this, he's reminding himself of what God has done. He's, he's beginning to look back and see a greater picture. And we don't know what God will do unless we can remember what God's already done. Now think about that. We don't, I'm going to say this one more time. We don't know what God will do if we don't know what God's already done. Amen. Sometimes we just have to think back in our life and know what God is capable of because He's done it before. We'll talk a little bit about that on Wednesday night. But as you begin to see and understand that when we begin to see what God's done, when we get a testimony of what God's done, you say, well, preacher, right, God ain't done a whole lot in my life. If He saved you, He's done a whole bunch in your life. If He's given you life and life more abundantly through the very person of Jesus Christ, He's done a big day's work in your life. And if we begin to look back, if He can save us from the pits of hell, I think about James and what it says there. It talks about if we, if we lack knowledge and if we lack wisdom and understanding, then we're to ask God for that. Why would, sometimes we get in our mind, why would God do this for us? Why would God give us wisdom? And why would God begin to, to take a lot of effort to put in our, or put a lot of time and effort into us? Why would He do this? Because He loves us. And there's no reason that we should ever doubt that God 
Bill wouldn't do anything for us, but because he did everything for us when he died on the cross for us. Amen. So why would he not give us that that we stand in need of to accomplish the task that's before us? Now look at this. As we begin to think about that, he's replaying God's mercy and love and compassion. And he's thinking about all of that. And you may be thinking, wow, that's kind of offensive to me that God would allow pain in my life. God would allow tragedy in our lives so we can be closer to him. Go back to Genesis chapter 32. You don't have to turn there. You don't have to do that, Rodney. I'm, just, I'm going to just reference it in just a moment. Go back to, to, to Jacob in Genesis 32. When God was wrestling with Jacob, and Jacob would, kept pushing against God, and kept shoving against God, and would not surrender himself to God, it says, the Bible says, then God touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh, and Jacob's thigh was out of joint. Why did God do that? God did that because Jacob would not surrender and he motivated him to surrender. And you say, that's a terrible God that would do that. But God loves us so much that he don't want us going the wrong direction. He wants to see us prosper. He wants to see us have life and have life more abundantly. And he will motivate us, even if it takes putting a little bit of hurt on us from time to time, to get us to the place that he wants us to be. He will, he will, call, he will call strive in our life to get us to the greater good. And I thank God that we serve a God like that. I thank God that He don't when I when I wander out and go in the wrong direction, then He don't just look and say, "Oh well, if He comes back, He comes back." No, He'll chase me down. He's the hell of heaven. He'll chase you down. He is the hell of heaven that will go look us up, hunt us down, and bring us back to where we're at. He said He left the hundred, He left the ninety-nine to go get the one that has strayed away. And I find hope and I find comfort in those words. But let's think about this for just a moment. Let's take it just a little bit further. Just know this. That the only way we can know Him and the only reason that we can know anything about God is because He suffered for us first. If He did not suffer on the cross at Calvary, there would be no way that we would ever know Him for truly who He was. <laughs> All we knew about God, if He had never went to that cross, if He had just been, if He had suffered up to the point that He was on that cross, and He had called out, the Bible says this is possible, He could have called out a legion of angels to have come and rescued Him off of that cross. And you know, you, you begin to think about that. Our Bible would be totally different, and our hope would be totally different if that's all He did. If that's all Jesus did is go and, and humble himself on the cross, get to a point in his life where he said, I can't take this, I'm tapping out. I'm not going I can't go forward with this anymore. And call down angels to rescue him off of that cross. And we read up to that point, what would make him any different than any other man? All we would say is I have hope that I'll be able to endure as much as Jesus did up to that point. Oh, but praise God, he went a little further. Praise God, he didn't call down a legion of angels. Praise God, he saw fit to humble himself even unto death because of the law that he had in his heart for mankind. He humbled himself to a point that he gave his life and we will be able to look beyond our circumstances, look beyond our situation, and have hope in what Jesus Christ did on the cross at Calvary. Now, as we begin to kind of, kind of understand that the only way we can be in a relationship with him is because he, the, the pain that he's already experience. Understand, if he had died on that cross, we'd have had no hope of being in a relationship with him because he would have just been dead. If that's all he did was die there, he would have just been dead. He'd have been no more than Muhammad or Buddha or, or any of them. And can you have a relationship with them? No. Because they're dead. But here's the difference. Here's the difference. We serve a God that not only humbled himself to death, but they placed him in the uh, bar tomb of Jared Joseph of Arimathea. And three days later, praise God, he come back to life. He ascended back to the Father. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father to make intercession in our life. And we can have a relationship with him. But not only that, he don't just consider that we can have a relationship with him. He comes out and indwells us. His Spirit comes down and indwells us that we might have Him wherever we're at. I said this a few weeks ago. I don't know if I said it on Wednesday night or if I said it in here. But you think about this. What's better than having God walk beside you? Amen. God lives inside you. Amen. It don't get no better than God living on the inside. And as we begin to see this, it was all because of what He did on the cross at Calvary because of the pain, because of the suffering, because of the heartache that He should that he suffered on the cross at Calvary, we can have hope 
that we'll be able to see him again, that we'll be able to spend our eternity in heaven. Think about this. This is the God of all. Here's the thing about him. Any pain that we feel, he's already felt. Yes. Any heartache that we go through, any suffering that, he, that, that we endure, he's already endured. And as we begin to ponder on those things, any injustice, and any time that we've ever been done wrong, and we come up to a throne of grace and say, God, you don't understand. God says, oh, well, you know I do understand. I've been hurt. I've been wrong. I've been, I've, been, I've been the victim of injustice. And I understand exactly where you're coming from. And I thank God that we don't have to go before a God that has no idea who we are or what, we, what we're going through. That when we cry out to Him, He says, I've been there. I've been there. I felt your pain. I felt your hurt. I felt your injustice. I felt every bit of it. And because of that, I can comfort you. I can sympathize, sympathize with you. That's the cross of Christ. That's what happened on the cross. It takes us to a higher place. It changes our perspective. Because of what He did on that cross, we can hold our position and we can persevere because we have hope in what He did. Sometimes I think when we get beat down and don't know what we, what we can make it through and how we're going to make it and what's going on, and we look around and say, God, are you hearing me? God, I don't know, I don't know if you're hearing me or not. We need to take our mind back. And sometimes we may just need to write it down like he told his Habakkuk to do. He said, just write these things down. Y'all can give us a song of invitation if you like. He said, write these things down. He said, because they're going to help. They're going to bring hope to your situation. I don't know where you're at today. You may be in a situation that you, you feel like there is no hope. You may be in a situation where you, it looks like it's, this is the end. It looks like there can't be any better. But this too shall pass. Because as we begin to look at that situation, we're seeing it from a seated position. We're seeing it from a, a position where we feel like we're surrounded. But as we begin to understand what God does, God raises us up. And sometimes I think that, that we just need to hear the voice of God. I get a picture of God going to speak to Habakkuk when he was in that situation. And God could just speak to him as a stand up. So stand up, Habakkuk. Just look beyond where you're at. Stand up where you can see. And, and Habakkuk, he begins to praise the Lord. He said, he gives me feet like deer. That I might be able to rise up. That I might be able to elevate myself. That I might be able to get to a point where I can see not just a little bit of the picture. Oh, but the whole picture. Because sometimes we're greedy and we're, we're carrying on and we're down and out about what little bit we can see. But when we begin to see all that God's doing, when we begin to see all that God's done, our faith increases. Our hope comes back. And I pray this morning that if there's somebody here that just, just struggling with something, it just, just feels like there's no hope, that there's no end, and this is it, and this is all it's ever going to be, that this is the best it's ever going to be. Know this. God has a greater plan for your life than your current struggle. Maybe you need to write that down. God has a greater plan for your life than your current struggle. I don't care what you're going through. You say, Christian, you just don't know. I don't know. And I don't need to know, but God knows. And He's got a greater plan for your life than what you're going through right now. Trust Him. Believe Him. And if you're here today and you've never embraced Him as Lord and Savior, what a wonderful day it'll be to come and know Him and free pardon and forgiveness of sin because of what He did on the cross at Calvary. As we begin to look at this this morning, we begin to find hope and comfort in His Word, and strength in His Word, new perspective in His Word. I just want to pray and ask God to meet with you at your point of need this morning and elevate you so you'll be able to see what He's trying to do, what He wants to do, and how He's going to move and work in your situation. Now understand, when He spoke to, to, to uh, Habakkuk, He didn't come down and say, oh, I'm going to make it all better. I'm going to make everything better right now just a little bit. You see, that's how we come when we pray sometimes. We come when we pray and we say, God, I need you to fix it. Fix it right now. God, I need you to make it all better right now. Right quick and fast life. But God's not always on our time. In the grand scheme of, of the eternity, God's got, a, God's got a, a long time. Sometimes I think that we look at, 
it, it, his time, our time, we think it should be all on the same time, but sometimes God just, just says, I've got something working. I've got a plan. I've got a purpose. Just wait on me. Hear me. Stand on that wall. Be that watchman on that wall and wait and see. And watch and see what I'm doing. I pray that if you're here this morning and you're struggling with a situation, I pray that God will give you understanding of what He's trying to do. Just know when you come out on the other side, you're going to be better. You're going to be stronger. You're going to be, you're going to be a better person. You're going to have faith that's going to be lifted up and elevated. You're going to have hope like you've never seen before if you trust Him and believe Him. But if we sit there in the mother group and don't have hope, don't ever let God elevate our hope and elevate our faith and work through us to change our us into who He wants us to be, We'll always be weak. And we'll always be pathetic. And we'll always be just a nominal, mediocre Christian. But if we let God work and move in our life, and if we let Him leverage our troubles and our trials for His, for our good and for His glory, we'll become a phenomenal Christian. Amen. We'll become a Christian that God wants to, to use to do great things. <laughs> and sometimes we can't, <clears throat> we can't see what God wants to do because we're not at a point that we're beat down. But stand up this morning. Stand up and allow God to let you see what He wants you to do. Let us pray. Father God, we thank You that we might be able to look to You, trust in You, to put our faith and our hope in You for everything that we're standing in need of. And God, we, Your people stand all across this, 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 this church this morning. God, I pray that You'll just give them perspective like they've never seen before. I pray, God, that You'll just take them from a standing position and elevate them just a little bit higher that they might be able to see and know what You're doing in their life. What they might be able to see. What You and know what You're doing in this church, God. Where their place of service is. What You want them to do. How You want them to serve. Show them opportunities of serving. And God, for that one that's beat down this morning, I pray God that You'd elevate them to a point that they'll be able to look beyond the, 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 the heartache and the trial and the strife that they're going through and look to the hill where their help comes. Look to a very a God that's sitting at the right hand of the Father of Jesus Christ that died on the cross and we can come to the throne of grace and we can petition the very God of heaven and we can come believing that God you're more than enough to meet that need that's in our life. I pray that you'll elevate them to that point this morning. Give them a new perspective. Give them a pers pers perspective like they've never seen before. And God tell them it might not be today. It might not be tomorrow but you're working. And God, you have a plan. And that plan is greater than that strife they're going through. God, I pray you'll give them hope and encouragement. I pray you'll move and work through the power of the Holy Spirit in the first one, two, or ten that need to meet you in this altar this morning. I pray God you'll give them courage and boldness to come right here and do business with you. And give that new perspective. Give that hope. Give that, give that desire in their heart, God, to, to trust you and to look to you. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your love, mercy, and grace that's been bestowed upon us. And we ask all of these favors in Christ Jesus' name we do pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.